The 280 horsepower Caterpillar Challenger, with a touch under 120,000 pounds, was well able to handle the 12 furrow Dowdswell plough at this 1991 demonstration. And the 210 horsepower Marshall TM200, also with rubber tracks, had no problem pulling this 7 furrow Dowdswell DP2. Originating from America, the square plough took the country by storm in 1990. They were simple to use, had few wearing parts, and worked well on hard, dry land. But by 1993, after a wet autumn, most of them were left in the barn. This Rabi plough with slatted mould boards is equipped with a furrow cracker. Introduced in 1995, it's more effective in normal ploughing conditions. Multi-furrow reversible ploughs, some with variable furrow width adjustment, at a 1995 demonstration, include this seven furrow Cavern Land on a Massey Ferguson 6150. A new Holland Ford 8430 with a semi mounted eight furrow Lemkin plough. And the JCB Fast Track 85 makes light work of pulling a six furrow plough. In another field, a 260 horsepower John Deere 8400 made rapid progress with its 10 furrow Gregoire Besson articulated plough. And an 11 furrow Dowdswell reversible causes no problems for the 325 horsepower Caterpillar Challenger 75C. many lips in the 1970s. Minimal cultivation methods were possible with chisel ploughs like the Bomford Superflow, and many farmers thought that perhaps the mouldboard plough had had its day. Many companies made chisel ploughs to cater for this new technique, including this Parmiter, pulled by a Belarus tractor, and Alpha Accord. Ransoms also joined the minimal cultivation scene with this heavy cultivator, which, in spite of its looks, the company insisted was not a chisel plough. Vicon introduced the rotospar to British farmers in the late 70s as yet another alternative to the plough. This power-driven spading machine didn't attract much interest from farmers, but it was used by some market gardeners. Soil compaction and drainage problems caused by heavy tractors also brought subsoilers into fashion during the 1970s. Subsoilers had been used occasionally for many years. This heavy-duty twin-leg model on a doe tool carrier was used before crawlers were equipped with a three-point linkage. The new breed of subsoilers included the Lely Brennig, with an oscillating blade in front of the leg. A simple single leg model made by Bomford and Evershed, seen on a Deutz 7206A tractor. and the Howard Paratine with angled legs. Although used less often, subsoilers can usually be seen after a hot, dry summer, and the latest models have wings to increase their effect.
Hedges still needed to be trimmed, sometimes by hand, and this was an easier task if the hook was sharp. Although less popular than in earlier years, it was still possible to buy a new circular saw hedge cutter in the early 1970s. This Fisher Humphreys machine could be used with a saw blade or a flail head. Most hedge cutters sold after the mid-1970s were flail machines. They became more versatile as time passed with increased reach and hydraulic motor drive. This McConnell hedger has its own oil tank and power takeoff driven pump. Cutter bar models, reminiscent of the earlier McConnell power arm, are still being made for compact and other small tractors. But in spite of some public outcry, the flail hedger was here to stay. Bonford and Evershed have made hedge cutters for many years. The first was attached to a Fordson standard. The farm trim flail hedger was in Bonford's mid-1980s range. Also, the super trim, used mainly by agricultural contractors, seen here on a Leyland 702. By the mid-1970s, many farmers were drilling most of their cereal crops in the autumn. And this work, together with the root harvest, changed the pattern of farming. Stubble cultivating usually preceded ploughing, often with one of the many models of springtime cultivator available at the time. A new design of subsoiler appeared in the early 1970s. The McConnell Shakerator was different because it had vibrating tines operated by an eccentric flywheel arrangement driven by the power takeoff. The shakerator could be used on its own or with a power-driven cultivator. Linked to the McConnell tillerator, this combination converted stubble fields to autumn seed beds at a rapid pace. New cultivation machinery was gradually replacing the more traditional tined implements by 1970. The Bomford turbo tiller with ground-driven rotary blades at a working depth of five inches. And according to the makers of the CB Rotary Harrow, the best results were obtained by driving the tractor at high speed. Power takeoff driven power harrows in use at the time included the Vicon with four reciprocating time bars. And the Benedict power harrow with two time bars, which certainly gave the tractor driver a more comfortable ride. Meanwhile, in Holland, Lely designers had already made and tested the Rotera. This model, with its rotary tines, was shown to British farmers in 1968. And within a few years, it brought about a new era in cultivation machinery. Disc harrows still had their place. Some of them were quite wide. Others very wide indeed. Springtime cultivators, narrow and wide versions, also survived the test of time. 